I'm starting my supper early today because I'm making chicken and dumplings. I always think of that as something that's, there's a lot of work up front, but then on the back side, we can usually eat it for several days. So that's really, really great. We love leftovers. And then on those days, I don't, you know, supper's a breeze, but it does take some preparation to actually make chicken and dumplings. Now the recipe is that I use is in mine and Jim's cookbook, Celebrating Southern Appalachian Food, and it's on page 64, 64. So there's lots of chicken and dumplings is one of those recipes that's so common and enjoyed by so many people that there's tons of variations, so many different variations on how to make it. And I think they're all good, all of them. Uh, there's variations in the way that you actually cook your chicken and actually make the broth. And then especially the dumplings. There's some people that like those really fluffy, kind of think of biscuits, those kind of dumplings. I think they're great. But what I really like is the ones that are, are thin and chewy. Uh, in some areas of Appalachia, they call them slicks, slicks. I never heard anyone call them that myself, but I did read that in a book. And those are the kind that I like. That's the kind that Matt's mother made, Miss Cindy. Granny makes chicken and dumplings too, but she likes those kind of fluffier uh, dumplings, which like I said, they are good. You just, it's one of those things, personal preference is how you, how you have to figure that out. But chicken and dumplings is a delicious recipe, delicious meal. It's a meal pretty much on its own for me if you have the chicken and dumplings, and I bet you can guess what I'm gonna say, and a cake of cornbread. I love to put my chicken and dumplings over top of my cornbread when I eat it. I've also got some two jars of our green beans we canned last summer. I'm gonna cook those, and I think I'm gonna cook some. I've got uh, from last year too, last year's garden, some okra. I've got it in the freezer, so I think I'll get some of that out and fry it. And that will be, and then of course make my cornbread, and that'll be a, a delicious meal. The green beans will be easy, because once I start them, they'll just cook by themselves. Cornbread I could pretty much do in my sleep. And then okra is fairly easy too. So the tough job will be the chicken and dumplings. So out here, I think you can see it in the camera. I've got some celery. I had it frozen in the freezer. I've chopped it up. I've got an onion. I normally use white or yellow onions, yellow mostly. But Corey had made us a salad for a supper two or three nights ago, and she left her the other half of her red onion over here. It was in the refrigerator, so I just want to use it up. I'm using it. And then I've got some carrots. I've also got some salt and pepper, and then I've already got my chicken in the big pot here. Now, different piece, people like, again, different pieces of chicken to, to use when they make chicken and dumplings. I've actually made chicken and dumplings because I usually try to just use what I have on hand. If I don't have anything but skinless, boneless breast, I've made it out of that. I think it's better when you have the bone-in chicken with the skin because it gives so much more flavor. But um, if you like to cook from your pantry, sometimes you just have to make do with what you have. So today, I'm kind of doing that even though I have the bone in with the skin on. I have two chicken breasts that I had just wrapped up. I probably bought a big pack and then wrapped them individually. So I have two chicken breasts with the bone in. More like breast quarters is what they are. And then I have one, two, three, four, five. I have five legs because I had a little pack of legs, of chicken legs, drumsticks. So that's what I'm using. I will read you the description from the, or the recipe from the cookbook. I'll put it in the description, um, the link to the cookbook, I will. So chicken and dumplings, three pounds of chicken pieces, water enough to stew chicken, it says about two quarts, but I find, and that's good to start out with, but again, it depends on how many chicken pieces you have, and then also what size pan you're using. You know, if you're using a, a wide, shallow one, or if you're using more of a tall, skinny one but you want enough to cover your chicken. And then as it cooks, you just need to keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't evaporate out and scorch. One carrot diced, one celery stalk diced, one onion diced, three fourth teaspoon salt, one half teaspoon pepper. And I'm gonna stop right there because that's just what I'm doing right now. And then I'll go on and uh, read you the rest when I make it here in a little while, probably be a few hours before I do that, but we'll, we'll do that. Uh, later in the day. So now that I've got my chicken in, I'm going to put all of my vegetables. And I did a video several, a couple of years ago about chicken and dumplings and talked a lot about it in that one. And I used vegetables like this. And uh, sometimes I, before I put the chicken in, I will kind of sweat the vegetables and do it that way. And most often I do it like this, this way. I don't know if I should even say most often though, because sometimes I, it just depends what mood I'm in. That's the, that's the way that I do it. Anyway, in that video, I failed to mention 
I wanted it to be like an authentic chicken and dumplings, which typically doesn't have the pieces of vegetables in it. So I took those out when I made the dumplings and put the broth back in and stripped the chicken off and did it. And I failed to mention what I was going to do with those. Well, that day what I did with them was, I think it was me and Corey and Katie all. We were all here, but I know it was me and one of the girls. We ate them with just with some crackers for our dinner that day. Now, sometimes I leave all this in, if, especially if it's a busy day. I'll just leave the, because they're good. You know, they're great to eat. A lot of them kind of cook down, but they're still really good to eat. But if you wanted to take them out, you could certainly you could just discard them. You could feed them to your animals, or you could eat them with crackers. They're really good like that, or any other way, too. Anyway, so I'm going to put all my vegetables in my big pot here. Miss Cindy got me this pot years ago, and I really love it. It's my biggest sauce pot, so if I'm going to... A lot of times when I'm making jelly and pickles and things in the summer, it's the one I use because it's not only larger, but it's tall, too, so you don't have to worry about stuff bubbling out. Then I've got my salt and pepper here. Put that in. And then all I need to do is get my water. This may not be enough, but we'll see. See if I've got enough. I may have to get a little bit more. Almost, but not quite. Okay. That's good. Now that's going to make, oops, that's going to make a really rich broth as the chicken cooks. So I'm going to put it over on the stove and uh, turn it up probably to about medium. Now once it comes to a bowl or a simmer, I may turn it down because I'm going to let it cook for, for a couple of hours while I go do some other stuff. Just keeping an eye on it to make sure it's okay. Now if I did not use chicken that had the skin and all that on it. There's so much fat that comes out of that and so many good little flavors. I might add some butter into this. Sometimes I do that anyway. Again, that's one of those things uh, that I just do on the spur of the moment. I might add some additional fat in the form of butter before I, as I start cooking it. That's the wonderful thing about recipes like um, chicken and dumplings, those tried and true that you know that lots of people just adore and love and they have all these wonderful memories tied to them of their mother or grandmother making them. But once you learn how to make the basic, like you know how to how it goes, how to how to actually put it together, I think from years of cooking, then you learn what you think for you and your family, because everybody has their own preferences, what what little touches or techniques to use. And I think that's really what develops those recipes into being our favorites that, you know, there's so often I cook something that Granny cooks and mine don't taste like hers. And I know there's just some little something she does that she don't even think about, you know. Um, of course, there's always the, the thing that people say, if you're putting love in it, that really helps too. So once this comes to a boil and simmers for a while, and I'm able to pull the chicken off, I'll show you that part, and then I'll show you how to make the dumplings too. It's time for me to make the dumplings. I went ahead and got my chicken out probably about 30 minutes ago and let it cool so that I could use my hands to get all the meat off the bones. I've, so I've got the bones and the skin here. There's so much flavor in them. You can, do, you can just discard them, do whatever you want to, but they're great to actually put back in a pot of water, maybe with some onions or celery or whatever, and just kind of let them uh, simmer and then make your own chicken stock that way. That's a really good ideal to do that with them. But right now, I'm gonna go ahead and take my meat. I've got my broth over there still simmering on the stove. And I didn't drain out the vegetables this time. Uh, one reason is a lot of them have, because I let it cook slow all day, a lot of them are kind of gone. But the ones that are there, I'm just gonna leave them. They'll be good. They'll just add to the flavor. And then it's late, so I'm, I'm running late, so I'm not gonna bother with that part. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and put my chicken back in, but before I do that, I'm gonna get out two thirds cup of the broth, and then I'll show you how to whip up the dumplings. Okay, now I think I've got everything ready, I hope so. So I'm gonna read you the rest of the ingredients for the dumplings. So you'll need two cups of all-purpose flour, you'll need two teaspoons of baking powder, a teaspoon of salt, and one third cup shortening or lard, and then when you begin to read, you realize you need that two thirds cup of broth. So I've got that right there. So, you, and um, let me just read it to you. It'd be the easiest way to explain it. After it is cooled, debone and chop or shred. So I've already done that. Vegetables can be discarded or left in the broth. Skim fat from broth if desired. I don't ever do that. Reserve two third cup of broth for making dumplings. Return chicken to the pot. So we've done all that. 
we're going to combine the flour, bacon powder, and one teaspoon of salt. We're going to cut in the shortening with our pastry, pastry cutter or fork until crumbly. And then we're going to add that reserved broth and stir with a fork. And then we're going to turn it out. We're going to have, you need a little bit of extra flour because we're going to turn it out onto a floured surface, knead lightly, and then we're going to roll it out to about an eighth of an inch thickness and cut into two inch squares to make your dumplings. Bring broth back to a bowl, drop dumplings in it one at a time, reduce heat, cover, and simmer for 30 minutes or until done. So, when I first started making uh, chicken and dumplings like this, I was really paranoid about how to do the dumplings, how to roll them out that part and trying to get them exactly square and uh, exactly perfect. I realized once they cook in there, you can't really tell what shape they were, so I don't worry so much about that anymore. But in the beginning, I remember I was really, really paranoid about it. And if you, I've never tried this with something like butter, but if you wanted to and you didn't want to use shortening, if you have lard, that would be the best thing to use. Let's see. Oh, and I forgot to mix in my, see, I'm talking and not doing. I forgot to mix in my salt and bacon powder, but it'll be okay. It'll still be all right. So kind of stir that in the edges and then start, start putting the, actually putting the shortening in, cutting it in the broth and put it in there. I think I got a few onions in there too, but that'll be okay. Because that broth is so hot, this makes it a really soft, soft dough. Let's see if I can just use my hands, probably be easier. me some dough out or some dough out some flour out for my dough I would need it a little bit in the bowl make sure I get all that though pour it out a little sticky come together. It's really warm. I think I failed an onion. We'll just leave the onion where it's at though. Okay, a little bit more flour and I think I'm ready to roll it out. to see now that I look at it. I'm not sure if you are or not. Okay, that's a little better. Okay, I think I'm ready to start rolling it out. Get my rolling pin here. And again, I used to be really, I'd get the measuring thing out when I first started, make sure that I got to an eighth of an inch, which is not very thick at all, and make sure that it was in, they were in perfect square, squares. Like I tried to make it a rectangle so that every side would have a right angle, and I quickly realized, well, that don't matter. Once they're in the broth, you really don't notice once they cook up. Usually I get to this point and my hands are all like this and I forget that to get my little pizza, pizza cutter out, that's the easiest way. I've used scissors before too, that's not bad, but usually I forget and then I don't want to touch anything and I don't want to wash my hands and I end up getting a knife. But today, I actually remember to get my pizza cutter out. So, okay, I think that's good. Now, I just start going just in strips this way and then squares, I mean then this way just to make the squares, but any way you do it will be fine. And I used to measure the size of them too, and now I just think 
I just go on what I think looks about right, and mine are never even. But again, once they cook up, it's totally, totally okay. And since my proportions were not even, the edges are certainly not. But again, it works out. They cook up just great. So I'll show you an example. There's one little little bitty one that was on the edge, but that'll be okay. And I usually use my bowl just to kind of lay them on the side till I get back over there to the hot liquid. And then I can start dropping them in a little bit at a time. I guess ideally, if you wanted to do it exactly right, that's what you're aiming for. But again, some of mine are perfect like that, and then some of them are missing part of the side because they were on the edge. But they will all taste good. That's the part that I worry about more than anything else. And you can see because they're thin like that, and once they're cooked, I'll show you, but they don't puff up like biscuits, like thinking of something that rises. They don't do that. I think I'll put me a little flour to make sure they don't stick together so they don't puff up now that's just like i said personal preference some people really love those big fluffy fluffy biscuit like type dumplings and they they are good i don't it's not that i don't think they're that i think they're bad it's just that i like these better the chewy kind of chewier ones okay i've got them all in the bowl now i'm gonna go over and put them in the broth so you can see the broth's bubbling there Another thing, personal preference, I'm just going to start dropping them in there, is that whether you like your chicken and dumplings really kind of thick on the thick side or if you like the brothiness, I like the brothiness, whether it's soup or beans or whatever it is. I really love the like liquidy broth more than the thickness of, say, soup beans or chicken and dumplings or soups, anything like that. I don't know. It's just a texture issue for me that I like the the thinness of the broth somehow really appeals to me but uh, so that means that I added some more water like as the chicken was cooking I, I keep that in mind so I wanted to make sure that it didn't all cook out because I want it to be like that but certainly if you like it to be on the thicker side you could let the you know you just have to judge that for yourself in other words you might want to let some of the liquid cook out cook instead of adding more like I did Try to drop them down in the sides too so they go down in the go down deeper and you can take a spoon and kind of gently stir them too but you got to be careful because if you stir too much they'll just come apart before they cook so you can see this is a big pot of dumplings and we will eat on them for the you know next few days Corey and Austin will they're going to eat with us tonight, and they may eat with us another night. And even if they don't, me and Corey and I mean me and Katie and Matt will eat them. But also, we will. Um, if you have any left, if there is any left, what I will do is I will just after a day or so, if we're like we're tired of chicken and dumplings, or we've eat them all, whichever. I'm going to get me a spoon and kind of gently move over there. Um, we will. I'll pop them in the freezer, and then on some night when I don't have, you know, supper. I don't have time to make supper I can just open the freezer and get out my chicken and dumplings and we'll eat them make a cake of cornbread maybe open a jar of green beans and I'll be ready to go Miss Cindy taught me about freezing chicken and dumplings when I had Corey and Katie she come and stayed with me a little while and you know to help with all the new baby stuff and while she was here she made a huge huge pot of chicken and dumplings and then we ate some but then she froze them into put them into like serving sizes for me and Matt and then put them in the freezer and I didn't really appreciate it at that moment I just thought okay whatever that's nice but then in the weeks to come I so appreciated it because every time I'd had a had a bad baby day or was just wore out I knew I had chicken and dumplings in the freezer so now I'm going to cover these and clean up my mess from this and then get started on the rest of the things, which is, let's see, what else have I got left? I've got my green beans over there cooking. They're pretty much done. I need to do the okra and the cornbread. Got everything cleaned up. 
that's my cornbread pan it's ready so i'm going to do my cornbread i've got it all ready right here to put in the oven but first i'm going to try to give me a, a knife here i was thinking about what i could have for dessert i wanted to make a cobbler but i run out of time so that's not going to happen but then katie she gave me the best idea. Matt Aunt Wanda and Uncle Sam come to see us a few days ago, and they brought us a little cake, a little pound cake. It's over here. We have plenty of strawberries, so Katie said, why don't you cut up some strawberries uh, to go with the cake? So she said you could do that if you wanted to. She actually offered to do it too, but I said, no, I'm going to be in the kitchen, so I'll do it. Anyway, so I'm going to chop up some strawberries. We could cut that little cake. I could make some whipped cream, which wouldn't take but a minute, even after we're eating I could have it going over here in the, with the mixer, let the mixer do all the work. So I'm going to quickly chop up these strawberries and get that started. I'm glad she thought of that. I was thinking, well, I've got some ice cream. We could do ice cream. And of course, you don't have to have a dessert, but sometimes it's nice to have a little, little something sweet. Now I've got them all chopped up. I'm going to add a little sugar. And actually, I wish that I had chopped them smaller. I don't know what I was thinking. I just sliced them. So I'm going to use my little, what I used to um, cut out my biscuits with, a little chopper. I'm going to use it to kind of give them another rough chop. I just sliced them into rounds. And then I thought, I should have made them smaller than that. Some of them are pretty big. And I said that Sam and Wanda is nice enough to bring us the cake, but they also brought us the strawberries. So... This will be a dessert uh, by Sam and Wanda, I guess. I should have done this earlier in the day if I thought of it so that the strawberries and sugar would have kind of had time to marry, as Matt would say. I think it will still be okay. Give me a spoon. sugar okay I'm gonna put them in the refrigerator and then I'll mix up my cornbread the dumplings are looking good I just turned them down to low and they can keep kind of cooking a little bit but they're done now I just need to do the okra and we'll be ready to eat going to use the same bowl that my cornmeal was in, my cornbread, so that I have one less to wash. I don't think I need this, though. Put it down there. So this is some of the okra that I put up last summer. I think this may be the last bag that we have, but I just get my, it's just for, I just, when I, sorry, when I'm trying to talk and then I was listening to that, thought they can't hear nothing I'm saying. When I put up okra in the summer, I wash it, let it dry, and then I just slice it up into the sizes that I would fry or put it in the soup or whatever I'm going to do with it. And then I look, spread it all out like on a baking sheet, put it in the freezer. Once it's frozen, then I get it out and put it in a bag like this so that I can just get out handfuls of what I need. And I don't put any cornmeal on it and I don't blanch it. I don't do any of that. Some people do and you got to do it ever how, what works best for you and how your family likes it. So I just get out maybe probably enough there. Maybe one more little handful. Then I can put this back in the freezer until I need it again. Sometimes before I actually freeze it, I go ahead and put cornmeal on it, but I rarely do that because it's like okra comes in so fast and heavy in the summer. It's like I'm like, oh no, I've got to put okra up and I don't want to take the time to do that, but it's easy just to slice it up and put it in the, put it in the freezer on those baking sheets. So now I'm I guess I should explain. I've got a video about okra, frying okra, so I could link to that. But I don't, I'm not, again, personal preference. Like when you go to a restaurant and you get the okra that's got a really heavy breading on it, I don't like that as much as I like the kind that Granny made when I was growing up, which is basically it's just been tossed in um, cornmeal. The okra's not like, I don't put it in egg or in water or milk or anything and then put it in the cornmeal. I just put cornmeal. It's like a dusting, a very light coating. So that's just how, how we like it. It's how I grew up on it. 
So that's what I like to do. Get me a, get me a spoon. I'm making a lot of noise, ain't I? So I'm just going to toss it around in there, even though it's frozen, and I'm going to go ahead and cook it just like this. Now, if you wanted one of those batter type, you know, like a thicker thing, you probably would need to use like maybe an egg, egg wash or dip it in egg first. Maybe soak it in corn or cornmeal. Soak it in buttermilk or something like that. This is very simple, but this is how we like it. I'm going to add some, a little bit of pepper and a little bit of salt. I've already got some oil heating up on the stove over there in my big frying pan. And again, oil, what you use is up to you. I, I like to use olive oil. I use olive oil for most everything, but you could use, Granny always used vegetable oil. You could use whatever you wanted to use. A lot of people deep fry it too. They'll put it um, like one of the baskets that you can lower and raise back up, and I think that works well. But I usually fry it on top of the stove, and then once it gets kind of done, or I think it's done, the last few minutes, maybe five, six minutes, I'm usually making cornbread, so I've usually got my oven hot already. I stick the whole pan in the oven, and that just kind of crisps it all up. Makes it really good. Okay, I'm ready to put it in the pan. To know if your oil's hot enough, you can drop a little cornmeal in there. You can kind of see it bubbling up. So I'm going to call that ready, and I'm going to start putting it in. Most of the time, I just use my hands, but you have to be very, very careful, or you will get burned. Because it's frozen, there'll be some popping. Okay, I'm just gonna let it cook. My okra's beginning to get some color on it. I'm gonna let it go until the cornbread comes out, which is about two minutes. Then I'm gonna pop it in the oven. And while I'm getting everything else ready, it can be cooking in there. Then we will be ready to eat. I've got the okra in the oven. Since it was up so high, 450, I turned the oven off. It's completely turned off, and the okra's just in there by itself. And I'll leave it about, about six minutes, something like that, because the oven is so high. The okra, fried okra recipe is in mine and Jim's cookbook, page 112. And it's actually given the recipe like, well, I mean, I say it's, it's me that wrote the recipe, but like you were only making okra. So keep that in mind. Like if you already had your oven hot with your cornbread, it makes perfect sense not to have to, you know, you don't want to cook the okra first and then it'll be cooled down by the time you actually cook your cornbread if you're making cornbread. Anyway, so... That's why mine, I'm doing it slightly different. It's just that my oven is already hot because of the cornbread, and it's way hotter, 450, than it would be. Uh, the book says 350, but that was like if you were just going to make the okra. You put fried on top of the stove for about three minutes, and then another three minutes, and then put it in the oven for 10 minutes, and that's done. You know, it'll get crispy and good like that. Anyway, just something to keep in mind. It's always good to utilize if you're... Uh, and I say, I tell people like my girls and people like that that don't know much about cooking is the best way to learn how to cook is just to keep cooking. Just keep doing it. Being a cooker, like Corey used to say when she's little, she wanted to be a cooker. Well, she's certainly found that out since her and Austin have been married. The best way to learn is just to do it over and over and then you figure out what works for you. And you also figure out as far as time. You know, like when I first started cooking, I thought of it as individual recipes. Well, like I was saying, if I made one thing, and then I set that aside and I made all the others and my supper was cold. So it's, it takes some practice to try to do it all simultaneously and get it all to be hot and ready all at the same time. But it's totally possible if I can cook, anybody can cook. So I'm gonna, about to call everybody in to eat. I'm gonna set everything here on the buffet like I usually do. And I think this is really gonna be a good supper. Okra looks really good. Everything looks really good. Except I'm being paranoid that I didn't make enough okra, but maybe I did. Maybe it's enough for all of us. Some people like their okra very toast, lightly toasted, and then some people more done, like with some little brown places on it. So that's something you have to keep in mind too when you're cooking it. You just have to keep an eye on it and decide what you like best. Okay, I'm ready to call everybody to eat. What's happening in there? That's going to be whipped cream for the Daddy. <laughs> strawberry cake, thanks to Sam and Wanda. The strawberry cake? Well, they brought a cake and they brought strawberries, so Katie had the ideal to have strawberries that and cake, good. so I was making some whipped cream. God, that's going to be good. 
So I'm just going to take this part to the table. Yeah. I'm going to get a bowl though. I love right now. Oh, that's the cabinet open. <laughs> I'm just messing this all up. I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. Cornbread back, do it again. Start over. This looks really good, Mama. Thank Green you. Green beans. Green beans. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, I'm going to have a little bit of fried right okra. How are you? I don't usually eat fried Pregnancy Cory is, uh, pregnant Cory has decided to eat all kinds of stuff that she normally didn't eat. I have, I have eaten all kinds of stuff I don't usually eat. It's kind of crazy. Mm -hmm. wonder if I'll be like that after I'm pregnant. Maybe. Maybe your taste might go back like it was, but it might not. I hope it stays like this. Yeah. I bet Austin does too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'd be just fine with that. Yeah. I'd be alright with that, huh? That looks really good. Oh, I gotta get some butter. I might take that to the table with me. Okay. No, I'd rather do the plate. It's too hard to have both. Yeah, I have that Looking real good. I've been excited all day. <laughs> about the fried oak. Oh, yeah. It is good. Dumplings. Huh. Hunting the dumplings. Oh yeah, always. I'm a dumpling kind of guy. That one of your nicknames for me is dumpling. Yeah, sweet dumpling. Little sweet dumpling. Looks like a feast. Absolutely. I've got the whipped cream in the mixer ready to go, so when we're ready for that. Now, I like to eat my chicken and dumplings. I bet you can already figure out, I already guess if you watch my videos, that I like to crumble up my cornbread and then I like to put my chicken and dumplings on top of it. And that's one reason I like all the, the brothiness. Mm. I just think it goes so well with cornbread but I think everything goes well with cornbread so I may be biased about that cornbread and the chicken and dumplings is a meal by itself. Give me a spoonful or two of the okra. I didn't get me a fork to taste though. Take a little little bite for you. I gotta have you gotta get the perfect bite. You gotta get chicken, cornbread and dumpling all in the same bite. I think this is one. Really good. Got the soft creaminess of the dumpling with the crumbliness of the cornbread and then the, the savoriness of the meat. Really, really good. Mm. Beans are good too. I'm gonna try some of the okra. Mm. Good too. Won't be long before I'll be having okra and green beans straight from the garden. That'll be really good. I hope you enjoyed coming along with me today as I cook supper for my family. I'm going to come back in after we all eat and make sure that we get the strawberry cake for dessert. We're always glad when you stop by to help us celebrate Appalachia. Your green beans have approached Granny's. Oh, wow. 
What a compliment. My green beans have approached Granny's. That's, those are very good. Mm, they are good. Wow. I'm feeling pretty good about that. That's nice. I don't want to cook them anymore. Oh, no. After eating yours and hers. Let's get you some cake. This is a dessert by way of Sam and Wanda. Whipped cream. This will be good for strawberries. Can you eat that? Sure or not, she may have. If she don't, you can have it. I'm just afraid I'd already had too much. No, I think it's good. Okay, a little piece of cake and some strawberries. Try to, I should have let them sit longer. Not too much juice in them, but maybe a little bit. And then some whipped cream. How does that look? Very nice, thank you. Mm -hmm. That was a surprise. I didn't know we had that one. <clears throat> well, thanks to Katie. I was going to make a cobbler and then I didn't have time, so then she had this ideal. Oh. So, one piece. Yeah. How big. That's good. Get you some strawberries. Thanks, Mama. This looks so good. good. Well, dessert by Sam and Wanda tonight. Is that like Amy's food cake? I don't think it's just like a pound cake. Mmm. There you go. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.